Understanding technological change is very important because you know, it, it's kind of like it provides kind of like the rhythm, the pulse of modern life and of how society at the end evolves because it evolves with technological change. It is not the same and we will talk about it separately, but technological change still, it's, it's kind of like the underlying base that uh, provides the beat to it. So let's talk about what technological change is. We will do that in different steps. We will talk about first what technology is, have a better understanding of that, then why does technological change accelerate? And that actually has to do with what it is. Um, and third, how does technology evolve? And finally, well, will technological progress overtake us? The singularity, the technological singularity, when the machines overcome us, we will certainly have to talk about that in a course that focuses on digital technology. But getting ahead of myself, uh, let's start with what is technology? So let's have a definition. Well, let's just ask technology itself. We, we have the luxury nowadays to be able to do that. Now, a few years ago, we couldn't have done it. But so I ask a large uh, language model and artificial intelligence, JetGPT, and let's see what it says. Technology refers to the tools, techniques, and system that are developed and used by humans to change the world. The different ones, uh, biological technology, it makes the world more efficient, enhanced communication. Uh, there are also some downsides to it while it evolves. And in conclusion, Technology is a complex and multifaceted concept that has transformed the way we live, work, and interact with each other. No, I do not expect you to memorize all of that, except if you want to take the, the job of JetGPT and become the next JetGPT, but you don't have to. What's the most important thing, I think, is that we have a basic understanding of it. So it helps us to think better about what technology is. And for that, we have to go into detail about some of the fundamental characteristics that help us as building blocks to quickly think to first of all understand what's going on and then act with an informed decision or intervention or make an informed decision intervention judgment about what's going on. Okay, so I came up with this short working definition, which is fourfold. It's just like I came up with it. I based it on the literature uh, that I really like about that subject, such as uh, Giovanni Dossi and, and, and Brian Arthur. Um, and I came up with these four points. That's what I gather. First of all is we can ask, so what? So, so what is it? Technology are standardized solutions for what? For addressing typical needs of society from what? Derived from knowledge about the world. So we understand something about reality. Um, that's, that's the start with it. And then in what we embed it into physical structures. So we understand something about reality we have some new knowledge, something about the universe around ourselves, we understand. Then we embed that into a physical structure in order to address a typical need. And we do that in standardized solutions. Okay, so what we're going to do now here in this part of this lecture, we're going to go one by one through that and understand it much better. So we, you know, we can use it as thinking tools. Okay, so for what is technology? Let's start with the end. Well, it's for addressing typical needs. And you already know from the literature that actually this is closer to the definition of innovation than invention, because an innovation is an invention that is socially useful. So now not all inventions, and innovations are even technologies. You could come up with, as I said, with a new accounting method, for example, I mentioned it before, uh, or a new way of uh, a new song that can also be an invention, a new, new melody that can be an invention and it can become an innovation. So we talk about technological innovations here, basically. So that's a subset, it's an intersection in this Venn diagram. Now, of course, especially in digital technology and with algorithm and with the algorithmification of society, technology goes more and more into innovation. So um, you can innovate with a new song and then you know you put in an algorithm and the song does it itself or an accounting method, which before would not be a technology. Accounting method can now be implemented in a software and then you algorithmify that process. So think about the intersections like that. So my definition of technology is more an innovations driven technology because I'm interested in understanding the society. So let's go through some of them. For example, one of my favorite ones that I use every day is the dishwasher, a fantastic example of 
something that addresses a typical need. Like you need to wash dishes every day. Now, of course, technology doesn't solve all the problems because somebody has to unload the dishwasher. If that's your job, that's your job. But you don't have to wash dishes by hand anymore. And it addresses a very typical need. Or the car, how to transport from A to B and how to transport heavy things from A to B. How to be mobile, the, the train solved that problem differently. So a typical, it answers a question, basically. Technology is an answer to a question. Now we can come up with evolving answers to this question. For example, when Martin Cooper invented the first mobile phone in 1973, it, it looked more like this. And you know, the answer, evolve. We still call the technology a mobile phone. It's still the answer to a very similar question, but the answer can, can evolve over time. That's one thing. And there can also be new questions posed. For example, so I just used chat GPT here. I mean, before we had large language models, before we had GPTs, we didn't even pose some of the, some of the questions. And now we can pose the questions, uh, to artificial intelligence even. So that's a technology, large language models, uh, and it addresses a typical need, how to provide answers to questions. Google search engine and solve a similar problem in a different way. It just gave you results. Now, this is an evolution. Now, they don't necessarily have to evolve to a more sophisticated stage. It can be still the same question. For example, the toilet solves a, a very typical, it addresses a very typical need. And we have a solution to it, but the solution might be very different. So I invite you to watch this little video here from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where you can see that the answer to address the typical need of a toilet, such as we solve it in the Western world, is not necessarily the best answer for the entire world. And we might need to reinvent a technology as foundational as the toilet. And the answer that we had came up with to address this typical need might not be the right one for a big part of the world. So you can also actually also go back and solve a problem differently. It would still be the technology that we generally refer to as the toilet, which addresses a very typical need of humankind. Second, from what, uh, from where comes technology? It's derived from knowledge about the world. So there is something new that we understand about the reality around us. For example, we su suddenly understand vapor and, and we understand the science of heat and we call it thermodynamics. And so we can really boost this idea of these thermal engines, steam engines, or we finally understand electricity and we build electronic motors. Um, and then it becomes, once we understand it better, we talked about that, you understand it better, we write down the equation, understand the equations of electromagnetism. Well, then we can build all kind of electronic machines. So we build our machines and while we build our machines, we understand something better. Uh, and then we can boost our machines. But all of that comes from knowledge about the world. Now, if knowledge is explicit, uh, then we make a science out of it and we can actually algorithmify it. But often it's explicit. We just tinker with something and we understand how something works. We encountered this idea before of tacit or implicit knowledge or explicit knowledge. And we said it's kind of like akin to when we first discover something or one of us discovers something like the karate master who does something, but even the karate master cannot really explain what he does when he does what he does, when he fights karate, just, it's just, just that's what it does. So an apprentice over years of going observation can kind of like get into the flow of it. Now, if you have explicit, if you tell me exactly what it is, what you do when you fight karate, you can download it just like they do in the matrix and you can, you have all the karate moves. So that explicit knowledge is a real recipe. And with, with algorithms, the same thing, some neural nets, we don't really understand what the neural net does, what it does, when it does, what it does. It just does. Yeah. Often we can open it up, we call it algorithmic auditing and studying machine behavior. And we see like, what is it exactly that this deep neural net is doing? And it's doing what it's doing. Uh, so we make it explicit. Once it's explicit, once we really understand the algorithm, we have the explicit representation, then things go extremely fast. And we can build amazing machines based on this knowledge understanding. Now, most technology is developed with explicit knowledge once we have the textbook, because then we can run with it. But as the example of deep neural net black boxes shows you, even technology can have tacit, implicit 
aspects of knowledge. But anyways, technology is always derived from knowledge, from understanding something about the world. Third, in what is technology? Well, it's embedded in a physical structure. So we have some knowledge about the world and then we put it in some physical structure. That has a lot of benefits because once it's in this physical structure, we can just share it. Um, let's, let's look at some examples. For example, Newton's 17th century to calculate a square root. That's how the algorithm goes, the, the recipe, right? The square root is equal to, you take the half of the previous result and then you plus the number there, and you probably learned this, so we can start with just any number. The number is two, and that gives us an estimate. Uh, the estimate, let's say, is one, and then we calculate 1.5, then 1.41, and 1.4142, and so forth. And we can actually calculate the square root just following this recipe by hand. You can do that in actually in elementary school. Now, once we understood that, we could embed this knowledge into a physical structure. And that's what we did. We put it into these kind of things, into calculators. And now you don't have to learn Newton's algorithm. This knowledge is in here. The cool thing is now I can share it with everybody. I can share that even with a six-year-old. And even so the six-year-old has no understanding what a square root is, I can ask the six-year-old, hey, with this help, can you calculate the square root of two? And the six-year-old can. So we understand something about the or some of us understand something about the world, then we embed it in a physical structure. And the cool thing is then we can, you know, shop it around, copy, paste it, diffuse it among everybody. So it's the fastest way of knowledge diffusion if we just embed it into our tools. Now, the hardware that you embed it with, the physical structure, is a little bit arbitrary. I mean, that's what the first computers looked like here and now that's what they look nowadays. But basically what these, the guts and the nuts and bolts, what they are is they basically execute this thing here. So what they did with this, you can really see it does like a half times thing than the previous results and that goes and then it rattles through uh, this wooden calculator from the 17th century. And this here, I think it's Leibniz calculator. And that's what it does nowadays, a very similar logic. It just rattles through these, these bones that imitate that. And you can also, what Jay did here, um, he built a Tinker Toy calculator and I invite you to watch this little video to see what Jay did. And the same as you can use Tinker Toys to calculate, you can also use something more advanced. One of my mentors, uh, Professor Len Edelman from UC, he invented the DNA computer. So he basically used DNA to compute and he solved some problems that other computers have difficulties of solving. And as DNA does what it does, it basically computes. So the takeaway here is we have some knowledge that you have when you embed it in a physical structure, you can embed it into different physical structures. Usually, you can embed the same knowledge often into metal or into plastic or into aluminum or into wood. It might have different properties. This might swim better than that here, and that's heavier, but this is more sturdy. But it, it could fulfill, I mean, the machine could fulfill a very similar, even, even an identical purpose. And that's the idea. So you have some knowledge, but then you embed it in a physical structure and look for a physical structure that best addresses your typical need, the typical need that you try to address. Finally, so what? So what is technology? And I said, it's a standardized solution. So the standardized, it sounds a little funny, but it's very important to standardize because otherwise we couldn't give it a name <laughs> if it wouldn't follow some standards. So for example, what is that technology here? Is that a phone with a keyboard or is it a tablet with a keyboard or is it a laptop with a removable keyboard or is it like, what is it? So, uh, but we need to give it some kind of name. And therefore, like we distinguish between phones and tablets and laptops, right? Funny. And we say they're different technologies. So that has to do with, well, phones have some standard and tablets have kind of like some standard and, and laptops have some standard. So that's why the standardized is important. Now, there are two ways you can give a standard de jure and de facto. And de jure basically means that official standard organization that basically we agreed on officially. We all got into a room and said, well, let's agree on that's the standard. And we did this more or less in a political, in a deliberative process, in a collective process. You can just collectively agree on it. It doesn't have to be a government or something, but usually it's agreement in a formal standard organization. For example, first G, second G, three G, four G, and, and now five G, and the upcoming six G telephony, these are official formal agreements from standard organizations. They have met, and they have met in the International Telecommunications Union, which is a part of the United Nations, is actually the oldest, I think the second oldest global organization. We created 
global organizations because we had a communication problem. We needed to find standards in order to be able to talk in different countries. That's why we started to create international organizations. And the ITU does that. I've been involved a lot in the introduction of 3G back in the days, and I've done research there with the ITU and with the United Nations. And these are processes where they basically sit down, the industry and government sit down and they deliberate and they just say, hey, 4G will look like that. And then they agree on that and they might not find the optimal solution, but it's better to have a standard so telecommunication system can talk than if you don't have one. So that's a de jure standard, de jure from your jurisdiction. Then there are de facto standards and these nobody agreed on, but they still dominate the world. For example, the, what I showed you before, the toilet, what we think of a toilet, um, you know, we think of a toilet with a water system, connected to a water system. A very famous de facto standard, which, which Paul David popularized in, a, in an important economic article about standards, is the so-called QWERTY typewriter standard. So the QWERTY typewriter, a keyboard standard, is because you can spell QWERTY here on the first line. If you look at your computer, you can spell QWERTY here. Uh, and that basically comes from because the salespeople who sold typewriters, when they knocked on the door back in those days, they usually knock with one hand on the door and then they had the typewriter in the other hand. And if you figure it out, check out the first line uh, on your keyboard. You could write type writer, the way the word typewriter, very quickly on the first line, just with one finger while you were holding up a typewriter here. So you held it and said like, this is a really cool machine. You want to buy it? You can write typewriter. And that's what they will do. So you can see it here, typewriter, check it out. Now, the other standards, the DSK standard that lets you type up to 40% faster. But we standardized on the, basically on the wrong system. How did that happen? Well, it happened because of these frozen accidents we say. So there is, this was a frozen accident, the thing with the, the salespeople. And that sometimes happened. For example, there can be a business alliance. Uh, when Paul Allen and Bill Gates uh, from Microsoft got together with IBM and just decided they will go together, well, that, that made the standard. And we're still using Windows operating system and it's been, been dominating the world. So was it the agreement of a formal standard body that officially agreed? No, it was just a bunch of people getting into a room and doing business and said, hey, why don't we go together? And they started to dominate de facto, for a fact, not by jurisdiction, but for a fact, they started to dominate what we now refer to as an operating system that has to do with windows, like, like opening windows, closed. not necessarily it has to be like that, but that's what we understand to be an operating, the technology of an operating system. So summing up, my short working definition, so what? It's a standardized solution for what? For addressing typical needs from what? Derived from knowledge about the world and in what? Embedded in a physical structure. Well, I invite you to think a little bit more about it, about each aspect of it, and I hope this definition will come useful next time you think about what technology is.